Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York. If E.L. Doctorow, Saul Bellow, or E.B. White were with us today, they'd tell you how highly they regard the work of my guest today, Pulitzer Prize winning sports writer Ira Burko. Now, Ira's out with a new book, How Life Imitates Sports, a collection of observations from 50 years on the sports beat, stories that illuminate a pantheon of personalities and events whose impact on our culture went far beyond the final score. Ira Burko, next. Ira Burko, welcome back to the program. It's good to see you. Nice seeing you again, Tony. Thank you. Uh, I love the book. Uh, I love your quote from Red Smith, who was your mentor, uh, and, and more, I think. Uh, you wrote a bio of him. Uh, Red said, sports is not a play world. I think it's the real world. And your book seems to be an affirmation of that, isn't it? Well, Probably so. I mean, uh, all of the athletes who I write about uh, are uh, in the throes of either doing something or not doing something, which is what we do in life. And uh, either they succeed or, or they don't. But uh, there's an effort given. And again, you know, if you don't succeed the first time, try, try again. And uh, to be a successful athlete, and maybe a successful person, uh, this is what you have to do. I'm, I want to pick out one piece. I mean, we'll talk about several of the pieces as we go along, but uh, one struck me particularly about Billie Jean King, and you wrote a, uh, uh, an update to it, a, you know, a current update for it, and you talked about how you misperceived the significance of her match back then with, you know, against Bobby Riggs. Uh, let's talk about that. What, what was your misperception, and how do you see it now? Well, it was... Uh, termed the battle of the sexes right and i thought this is a tennis match i mean it's between a woman and a man and then it turned out that it was going to be a battle of the sexes uh and uh you know and and so much was riding on it and uh, uh or two things were riding on it number one it was the uh, uh overcoming uh rinse the humiliation of uh, margaret court previously to uh, his match against uh, billy jean king Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, and then um, uh, Riggs didn't realize how important it was for him because he said that after he had tried to uh, defame women in a, a, a jocular way, in a, in a way, uh, to uh, defame women in some ways, um, that after the match, he was a single guy. He said, I was having a lot of trouble getting a date. So uh, so the impact uh, was on uh, both of them. But um uh, to show, uh, Billie Jean King wanted to show that, that women can compete against men and, uh, and even against an older guy like Bobby Riggs, who was still a very good player. Uh, and, uh, and I think she elevated the, uh, the, the sense of women, especially after uh, uh, Margaret Court uh, had uh, uh, so, so uh, humiliatingly uh, lost to, uh, to Riggs previously. Yeah, um, I talked at the at the beginning in the introduction about your writing and 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 several eminent writers who who appreciate it and have said so, and I, I want to go to some of that writing, um, which is elegant. I think uh, you have a you have a piece about Ted Williams. You were apparently at spring training, Red Sox spring training, one year, and here was Ted Williams uh, instructing about hitting. And what you wrote was this, Ted Williams on hitting is like Lindbergh on flying, Picasso on painting, and Little Richard on tutti frutti. That's pretty good. Love Little Richard. I always, I always said that if, if I were transformed into a groupie of some sort, it would be following Little Richard to the ends of the earth. I mean, uh, I, he was funny, he was talented, uh, he had perceptive, uh, uh, he was perceptive about a lot of things, and uh, I, I like Little Richard a lot. Also, like Picasso. Uh, he wasn't. And, Picasso uh, wasn't bad either. Yeah, I, I wasn't such a fan of of Lindbergh after his anti-Semitism, but uh, he did a nice job as a pilot. 
Yeah, Picasso did uh, did okay in you know many different moods. Yeah. Um, on, on the on the writing uh, further, uh, Ira, you have written you know for the Times, you wrote for twenty six years, but you wrote for other uh, organizations. But you also wrote for Art News, and uh, at least a couple of times. And uh, one of those writers that I quoted at the top was uh, pointing out your eye, your eye for detail. I wonder, did you ever, was art an important part of your, your early life? And did you think about some career in the, in the art field before journalism? Well, um, when I was in grade school uh, in Chicago in the seventh grade, uh, we painted and um, I had some of my paintings uh, were framed and put into the uh, assembly uh, uh, hall. Uh, and then I, it's in the seventh grade, I was 12 years old, uh, uh, I got a scholarship to the Chicago Art Institute. And uh, so I went and uh, I wanted more like just uh, cartooning or, uh, uh, you know, kind of a easy kind of painting. And, and they had me uh, like uh, painting or, or drawing models and, and even lewd models at, at the, and at 12 years old, this was, this was a little too much for me. And so, uh, but at the same time of my uh, uh, losing interest uh, in art, uh, I developed an interest in baseball. And so, uh, and then later basketball. And then I, I, I spent, uh, I, I dropped my, uh, my interest in art and um, it, it, uh, baseball and basketball really became uh, consuming to me. And, uh, uh, but as years went on, uh, I still had an eye, I thought, for art, and it, it grew and it learned, uh, and, and it expanded. And, uh, and then I remember um, I picked up a book uh, by uh, Winston Churchill called Painting as a Pastime. It was an essay and put into a little book. And, uh, uh, and uh, he, he was writing about when he was in disgrace, really, uh, as uh, the Secretary of the Navy, uh, and, uh, and they had lost big battles. And he was out to pasture, and he was in his fifties, and he just picked up painting, and uh, and he was concerned about detail. And this book was very important to me. And among other things, he said that he, he for the first time he really began to see shadows on buildings, and mm -hmm. uh, what that means is that you're looking closer at things. And uh, then, as a sports writer, uh, I began noticing shadows on a basketball court or on a, a baseball field, but, among, uh, but also other things, uh, just uh, the way a guy moved uh, and, and things that maybe uh, if others who weren't that interested in art and picking up stuff didn't see. And um, uh, I got a compliment uh, from uh, Scott Turow, the, the writer, and uh, it's, he's quoted in my, in my book. And, uh, but he said uh, that I had an eye for perfect detail. Well, I'm not so sure it was perfect, but it was a, a, an attempt at an eye for perfect detail. And so uh, that's where uh, my, uh, uh, my background in art uh, came about. And, um, uh, and then one day, um, uh, maybe it was a, a prisoner in a, um, in a, uh, in a prison in, uh, in New Jersey, and he was in for art forgery. And, uh, uh, and he wrote me, uh, I guess he, he saw that perhaps I had an eye for detail. And uh, he said that he would like me uh, uh, to write his, uh, his, a book about his life. Uh, and it turned out, and then he asked me, well, what writers or what artists do you like? So he, met, I mentioned, he mentioned a few and I, one of them was Winslow Homer. And uh, I liked Winslow Homer a lot, especially his, his drawings uh, during the Civil War. He would be on a hill watching a battle and then he, he would sketch that. And um, so um, I said, well, uh, Winslow Homer. And so this art forger uh, sent me a framed uh, uh, drawing, supposedly of Winslow Homer, but it was him doing it. He looked just like Winslow Homer. And he had the frame looking old and, uh, and de decayed, but, uh, but he sent it to me and I put it up on the wall. And this is, this is my uh, most important fake, my, my most important piece of art, which is fake. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, that was we, we never did do, do the book, but uh, uh, I had a good time with, with this art forger for a while anyway. Should have done the book. It would have been fun, I think. But, yeah. um, you know, I, you know excuse me. Uh, uh, one, one thing is 
now I remember how he came about. I had written a book about a jewel thief called The Man Who Robbed the Pierre. And he's reading this book in prison. <laughs> Why <laughs> this book was in the prison library, I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's a, a very interesting <laughs> librarian that prison had. Um, yeah. You talked about you talked about um, uh, you know first having a, a very strong interest in art and then losing it and 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 having it be replaced by sports. So at that point, did you say I I'm, I'm going to be a sports writer? Was that your ambition? Oh no, uh, I grew up first on the west side of Chicago, and then I moved to the north side of Chicago. And uh, uh, I had no. I did know a writer, had no interest in, in being a writer, and I, I wasn't sure what to do with my life. And I thought that I was gonna be a lawyer. I was at Miami of Ohio, Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. And uh, I, um, I was across the dormitory from a, uh, a, a fellow named Dave Bergen, and we became friends. And I was an English major because I couldn't be a carpenter or a plumber. And I, had, and I was okay in, in, the, in English, so I majored in English. And, um, and he said, why don't you come right on the school paper? He was assistant sports editor. And um, so I said, but I've never even thought about doing anything like this. And he said, come, come, and, come and try. And so it, it, my first assignment I uh, gave me uh, was to, co uh, to interview the, uh, the tennis coach of Miami. They were gonna play Xavier. And I never played tennis. And I, I lived on the West Side, it was kind of a tough neighborhood. And um, if anybody saw you in shorts and with a tennis racket, they would beat you up. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I had no, I had no interest in. I avoided tennis. So anyway, um, uh, I went. And I did the story. He gave me the questions to ask, and I wrote it up, and and it got a, a reaction from um, people around the school, and and people worked on the, on the paper, the school paper called the Miami Student. And from there, I just, oh my God, this is fun, and what a nice reaction, you know. And um, and then sometime after, uh, the assistant. Dave Bergen was his name, the assistant sports editor. He became the sports editor. And, um, and he said, I want you to write the column. At this time, he was writing the column. And so I said, Dave, you're writing the column. He said, no, I want you to write the column. And he became a huge factor in my life in, in a lot of ways. But, um, and then um, uh, I kept doing it and I kept getting a, a lot of reaction. And I wrote Red Smith out of the blue. I sent him two of my columns uh, in the school paper. And, he wrote me back. Wait, wait, whoa, stop! You, you're now writing. You're, you're a, you're a, you're a uh, neophyte columnist for the school you, newspaper, right? And you send a couple of columns to Red Smith, the yeah. Red Smith, yeah, hoping that he would what? Hoping that he would give you well. Uh, I, I was really loving this writing, uh, and I mean, it was just like Alice in Wonderland. It's just like she fell into a hole and she's in Wonderland. And that, that's sort of what happened to me. And I said, my God, this guy's great, you know? And, um, and then when I started writing on the school paper, uh, I decided I was gonna send Red to my columns and see what he thought. He was, at the time he was with the New York Herald Tribune. And um, what, so what did he, he actually, he actually responded, didn't he? And he responded uh, shortly after and he wrote, Dear Ira Burko, my advice to you is try again <laughs> and again. If you're for this racket, not many really are. You'll have an attorney of tears and sweat ahead, but God bless him. And, he, and they made a couple of comments about, specific comments about uh, my, my writing. And, um, and, uh, and then I, I got this and I didn't know, you know should I be um, uh, uh, delighted that Red Smith took the, took the interest in me or uh, should I be hurt uh, uh, by it? And I decided I'm not gonna be hurt. I took the two columns. Oh, he said he was going to make marginal criticisms, but they wouldn't have made me happy. So <laughs> I got the two columns, I pasted them up, I folded them into an envelope, sent it to the same address, Red Smith, and I said, dear Mr. Smith, please make me unhappy. And from there, and he began editing my, my stuff, and I, we developed a correspondence, and then we, we developed a friendship. And, it, and, you it, wrote, and you wrote his bio. Well, and then, and then we, we overlapped at the Times for nine months, and then he died. And uh, then I was home uh, writing a column on Red Grange, the old football player. And I got a call from Joe Vecchio, the sports editor of the New York Times. And he said, I got bad, bad news. Red had been sick. And he said, um, he said, Red passed away. And we have an advanced obituary in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, our files, but we don't like it. And we'd like you to write 
the obituary. Mm, and um, yeah. and so uh, uh, I said, well, I, I have a lot of stuff at home I can do. He said, no, we want you to come into the office. So I went into the office and I wrote a long, long thing and uh, got it on deadline. And then the next morning, and uh, I, oh, I got the paper at the door, my doorstep and I opened the paper. I, I go to the sports section and the obituary is not there. And, and then I look at the obituary page and the obituary is not there. And then I fold the paper up and there on the front page uh, below the fold was my uh, 2,500 word, I think, uh, uh, obituary on Red Smith. And, um, uh, and that was the conclusion. And then um, uh, Jonathan Siegel at, um, uh, who was at Random House uh, asked me to write the bio on Red and, um, and I did. And, and it, uh, it got a nice reaction, I'm happy, to, I'm happy to say. Yeah, well, the rest is history. 25 or so books and uh, this book of 50 years of, of reporting on, on the sports beat and uh, some pretty good writing as I've cited already. Um, and I wanna cite another one uh, line that I really like. Uh, when you're writing about Bart Giamatti, who was uh, the, at the, at the time of your column, he was being uh, uh, presented as the president of the National League. And, uh, and at this press conference, uh, you know, everybody was asking this guy uh, why he would leave Yale. He was the president of Yale, Bart Giamatti. And you write, it is natural to wonder why a man who led the cheers for Eli Yale scholars would decide to join the sweaty forces of the cleated and nickered. Um, yeah. And what, what did he have to say about that? <laughs> well, we, we actually became pretty friendly. And uh, he took me to task. Uh, uh, he wrote uh, something uh, opposed to uh, Pete Rose when he was commissioner. And, uh, and I felt it was, uh, it was unfair for him to intrude himself at this particular point. And I, and I wrote a column uh, with the head, I wrote the headline, uh, uh, Bar uh, Giamatti's John Hancock. And, uh, and he was unhappy about this, but we had a good relationship. And, um, and then I, uh, I used to play uh, uh, in a basketball at, at a very uh, good court near my uh, apartment uh, in, uh, in Kipps Bay. And uh, at four o'clock, the games would start. And uh, I had my sneakers on and I was about to go play. And I got a call from the, the office and they said, Giamatti died. And again, we'd write, like, like you to write a column on it. Well, I had my sneakers tied. I had my basketball ready to go and they <laughs> want me to do a column. And so uh, should I play or should I work? <laughs> and I, I took the ladder and, uh, and, and wrote the column. And, uh, and it was interesting for me that um, uh, when Faye Vincent, who was then the um, vice uh, commissioner uh, uh, to Giamatti, now became the commissioner of baseball. <clears throat> and sometime afterward, I went into Giamatti's, uh, into uh, Faye Vincent's office to interview him. And on the wall was the framed column I had done on Giamatti and uh, I thought that was that was sweet and satisfying. You, you won your Pulitzer Prize, you shared the Pulitzer Prize for a series uh, that the Times ran in early in this century uh, about how race is lived in America and in this book uh, readers can can see your columns about some of the leaders for civil rights, Arthur Ashe, Muhammad Ali, Jackie Robinson, John Carlos, Gail Sayers. I, I, Gail Sayers, you know, is not the first name that comes to mind uh, of an athlete, you know, when you're thinking of athletes who may have been prominent in civil rights, but um, talk about him a little bit. He just passed away recently. Yeah, he just passed away and, uh, and, he, and he stood up, uh, he, he stood up for civil rights. So, uh, I mean, he wasn't as prominent as some of the other athletes. Uh, perhaps he didn't, he didn't have to be, uh, but you know, he got, he was injured really bad. And then uh, he came back, uh, almost limping and, uh, and led the NFL in, in Russia. He was fantastic. And he, he had such graceful moves and he was, he was phenomenal. On his gracefulness, you have a lovely, uh, anecdote in the book about what, uh, what the renowned ballet dancer, Edward Valella 
says yeah. about Gail yeah. Sayers. Uh, I, I interviewed Edward Villela uh, uh, talking about dancing and about sports. And, um, and I asked him, this was in 69, 70, 71, when, when Sayers was, was playing. And I asked Edward Villela um, if, if he had started early, who among all the athletes, he was a, a sports fan, who among all the athletes that he's seen uh, would, would, have, would have made a great ballet dancer? And he said, Gail Sayers. Okay. Mm. So now a year or two passes and I was friendly with Gail and I, I ran into him uh, at some function and I, and he was with his then wife, Linda. And uh, I said, Gail, uh, I want to tell you what Edward Villela said. And so I repeated Villela uh, that uh, it, Sayers would have been a, a great ballet dancer. And his wife began to laugh. And I thought maybe she's viewing him in a tutu. Uh, and I said, well, uh, Linda, what, what's so funny? She said, Gail can't dance. And I said, Gail, is that true? And he sort of shrugged and he said, yes, I can, a little. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's marvelous. Uh, more about the Burko eye. You, you, you had a lunch or dinner or something with Martina Navratilova and she's uh, she's at, I think this was at the Oak Room in New, in New York yeah and uh, she's ordered a steak and it comes and it's too rare and she sends it back and it comes back and it's too rare and she sends it back and of course Martina had recently defected and you're watching this and the Burko eye uh, gets translated into this sentence. No one, apparently, is going to make Martina Navratilova swallow anything that is too red, political or edible. I wrote that? <laughs> yeah. Well, then I look back. I mean, this was like, what, 50 years ago or something like that. You know, uh, okay, I'll, I'll accept that. Uh, no, she was, what, like 18 years old and she's new in America and her English isn't even that good. But it's good enough to say, no, I don't want this steak. Take it back. <laughs> and uh, she was great about that. But um, and then I realized, oh, my God. I mean, she knows what she wants and she knows how to get it. And uh, and from that point forward, I became a great Martina fan. And in fact, um, years later, it was not, uh, 1981 or 82. And I went to do a story on her when she was living with Nancy Lieberman in um, in, in Dallas, and I always brought my basket, my basketball shoes, wherever I could, I, and I play pickup games. And um, uh, Nancy Lieberman was was teaching uh, Martina how to play basketball because she thought that um, per, uh, uh, moving from side to side in um, in basketball would be helpful helpful to her in tennis, um, and also quick re reactions. It was true, and um, and a and a uh, a a Times photographer was there and uh, he captured a picture of uh, a Martina guarding me and I'm taking a jump shot and which is in the book and um, someone had said that uh, my form looks looked pretty good uh, but Martina's looked great I mean she was she jumped up with, and just extended and I did get the shot over her but um, she was even just jumping to block a shot she was graceful. I mean, beautiful. And uh, anyway, I'm, I'm happy to have that that photograph in the book. I, I, I'm happy to uh, that you included a, another meal with another athlete, um, Katarina Witt, who was the great East German uh, figure skater. And you ask her, Katarina, what kind of man do you like? And what was her answer? Um, I, as I recall, I haven't read my book in a while. <laughs> uh, as I recall, she said, uh, I like a man who I can steal horses with. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. 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 I, I, I like a man who I can steal horses with. And, and she said, that's an old Romanian, uh, uh, German, that's an old German saying, uh, that, you know, it, you're comfortable doing something with, with somebody else. But, uh, it was kind of a striking uh, metaphor. She was a delight in, 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 a, in a lot of ways. <laughs> and, uh, um, uh, and, and, and uh, when she, uh, when she uh, danced, uh, skated, she was now past her prime. And I, uh, I was at the, the 94 Olympics in Lillehammer. And I think she came in 
seventh or eighth, but after having won two gold medals in, in previous Olympics. And uh, she had a, a striking uh, a red outfit on and she danced uh, to Where Have All the Flowers Gone? Because there was still war in Sarajevo where she won her first gold medal. And, um, and it, was, it may have been the most moving moment uh, for me uh, in the Olympics, other than perhaps the uh, Tanya Harding uh, fiasco, which was yeah. quite, quite interesting. Uh, we're, we're really short of time, and I wonder if you can tell us quickly, why did you do a column about Abel Kiviat, and who was he? Uh, Abel Kiviat uh, came in second uh, in the 100 meter uh, dash in the 1912 Olympics. And when I interviewed him, you can figure out the time, but he was 98 or 99 years old. The most uh, striking thing from the interview with uh, Abel Kiviat, he was 99 years old and he died shortly after. But he said um, he, was, uh, he, he, he wanted a, a wife. He was hoping for a wife. And he said that um, she, ha she doesn't have to have teeth, but she has to be able to drive. <laughs> 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 it doesn't get any better than that. And that's why. No, no, no. Uh, oh, but by the way, and, and he came in. Uh, oh, he roomed with Jim Thorpe in the in 1912 uh, Olympics. Uh, a little Jewish runner and, and Jim Thorpe. He it's was all great. in the book. It's all in the book. Ira Burko's book, How Life Imitates Sports. It's a delight to see you, Ira. Thank you for this. You Thank care. you for having me. Thank you for coming.